Okay, so let's look at uh, lesson 7-1 today. Uh, first off, uh, just a note about uh, what we're going to be doing with this chapter and the following chapters. Uh, chapter 7 is all about powers. We're going to be talking about uh, exponents, how uh, some application for some different exponents. We're going to talk about negative exponents, positive exponents, uh, roots. That's going to bring us into chapter 8, which is going to be dealing with more with uh, negative exponents and how they relate to inverses and and uh, dealing with simplifying radicals. Um, and then that's going to bring us into chapter 9, which uh, does a lot with uh, logarithms. That'll be the first time we hear about that. And uh, dealing with a lot of application with what we're going to be doing with the next couple of chapters. So here's what I'm getting at. The next three chapters are very important. They all uh, kind of build off of each other. So it's really important to take good notes and to make sure you understand the basics. If you don't understand the basics as we go through these, you're not going to know uh, as we get into other sections, you're not going to have a foundation on which to build on. So uh, if you want to be successful for the next three chapters, you need to make sure that you're getting it all as we go through it. Don't wait to the end to try to figure it out. You will not get it. Okay. Now, with saying that, a lot of what we're going to be doing, at least in this chapter, is going to be review. Sometimes even the review will start out simple, uh, but in that particular lesson, it'll end uh, with some brand new stuff that you haven't seen before. For example, right off the bat here, we start out with something basic. We know that when we see something written like this, we know that this number up in the air, we call that an exponent. Okay, that's nothing new. However, this is really important. It's important for you to understand that the number that sits on the ground that has a name, we call that the base. So the base is the number or the variable, whatever it is that's sitting on the ground. The exponent is the number that's up in the air. And we call this as a whole, we call this entire thing a power. But the important thing is to make sure you understand that the base is referring to uh, that part. Because that will help when we talk about logarithms later on. Now all this is saying, you don't have to write down uh, all of this. I'll highlight uh, what's important as we go through this. Um, so having said that, make sure you understand those. And here it just says when n is a positive integer and b is any real number, one way to think of b to the nth power is as the nth term of a sequence. So b squared would be the second term of a sequence, b to the first being the first term, b to the second being the second term. It's not something that's going to be real handy, but just to make sure we mention it, this is important to understand. The repeated multiplication definition tells us that if we have x times x times x times x times x times x, so here we have x being multiplied times itself six times. We know that a way that we can write that is x to the sixth power. We call that the repeated multiplication definition. Now that comes in handy for examples like the next one. Here it says, suppose the probability of an event happening is p. Let a be the probability oops, of the event happening four times in a row. By the way, if you have my notes, there's a little typo there. I missed a typing in that t to make that event. But anyhow, so here's what we have. We have a, we're going to represent that, be the total amount or the probability of some event happening four times in a row. Well, with probabilities, the way that we figure that out is if I have an event happening four times in a row, that's the same as this, which, using what we just talked about, the repeated multiplication definition, tells me a better way to write this would be just p to the fourth. So what we're going to do is we're going to graph out what this probability would look like. Now, a little note about probabilities, like I said here. Probabilities always occur between 0 and 1. If I have something that's got a probability of 0, that means it's impossible. If you have a probability of 1, that means that it's um, impossible for it not to happen. That means it's, it's going to happen 100% of the time. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a table of values to be able to graph them. So we'll use P as our x-axis, and A being our total amount as our y-axis. We're going to find this by taking P to the fourth power. So let's say if I have, like I said, a probability of event 0 happening. Well, 0 to the 4th power is 0, so the probability of that happening is going to be 0. Let's say if the probability of something happening just once is 20% chance, which would be 0.2. Well, the probability of that event happening four times in a row is 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.2 times 0 0.2, which is 0 0.0016. 
So what that means is if I looked at this as being a percent, the probability of something happening, or if, if, I, have a, some, if I have an event where the probability of that event happening just once, I have a 20% chance, the probability of it happening four times in a row is going to be 0 0.0016, which as a percent is 0.16%. So not very likely. Let's say if we increase our probability to being 40%. So 40% would be 0.4 as a decimal. So if I take 0.4 to the fourth power, that gives, gives me a uh, probability of the event happening four times in a row is going to be 0 0.0256. If I wanted to interpret that answer, which you'll be asked to do in your assignment today, 0.4, having an answer of 0 0.0256 means that if you have an event whose probability happening just once is 40%, the probability of it happening four times in a row is about 2.5%. So better likely, better odds than um, 0.2, um, but not quite great odds. Now what you might be noticing here is going from 0.2 to 0.4 we doubled. But notice our probability uh, more than doubled. This is because it's happening exponentially. It's not linear. So let's look at another one. Let's say better than 50% chance. We have a 60% chance of this event happening. Well, what's the probability of it happening four times in a row? Still not great, but better than what we've seen. It's going to be 0.1296. Let's say if we have a probability of an event happening 80% of the time. The probability of it happening four times in a row would be 0 0.4096. Where if I have a probability of an event happening 100% of the time, the probability of that same event happening four times in a row would not still be 100%, which would be, so we would just use 1. So if we graph this to see what the graph would look like in this scenario, 0, 0 would be here. 0.2 and 0 0.0016 would be barely off the line there. And 0.4 and 0 0.0256 should still be barely off the line, but we'll put it a little bit higher than the previous one. 0.6 and 0.126, well now we're a little bit over halfway here. And 0.8 and 0 0.4096 would just be a little bit past 0.4. And now 1, it's got a probability of 1. It is possible to have percentages between 0 and 0 0.2. I would say 0 and 20%, I should say. So we would connect them, and this is what your graph would look like. So it's important to recognize we're going to talk more about exponential growth, but that's what this is representing here. Some terms, some phrases to be familiar with is, first off, if I have x to the first power, let's start with the second one here. We call this the identity function. In math, the term identity refers to um, what we would do for the number that stay the same. In other words, for addition, we would add zero. So the identity um, rule for addition would be you'd add a number to zero and it'd stay the same. For multiplication means you'd multiply it by a one. For dealing with powers, we'd have an exponent of one for it to stay the same. So that's what the identity function represents. We have two other special scenarios. We call those the squaring and the cubing functions. And if we ever have just x to the nth, we call that the nth power function. So where you'd see that is, let's say if we have something raised to the seventh power, sometimes your book will ask you for uh, what would be a function for the seventh power function. So you'd say y equals x to the seventh, or f of x equals x to the seventh. The nth power functions where n is greater than 3 don't have special names. So here's what I'm referring to. Sometimes they'll ask us to graph uh, the cubing function. The cubing function, again, is going to be this, y equals x cubed. So since we don't know what this is going to look like, let's uh, come up with just some random numbers for x. Since we can pick any numbers, let's do some like this, like negative 2 negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. 
Again, this is a cubing function, so when I cube this, negative 2, when I cube it, becomes a negative 8. Not negative 6, we're not multiplying it times 3. We're multiplying it times itself 3 times. Negative 1 cubed is going to be negative 1. 0 cubed is 0, 1 cubed is 1, 2 cubed is 8. Now watch what happens when I graph this. Negative 2, negative 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We'll estimate 8 to be there. Negative 1, negative 1 is here. 0, 0. 1, 1. And 2, 8. So that's what your graph would be. So this one, your domain and range would be all real numbers. Because if we look at x, I can put any number I want in there for x. I can put negative numbers, positive numbers, decimals, zero. Any number I can think of, I can put in for x, so my domain is all real numbers. In the range, if you look at your graph, the graph goes infinitely up, it goes infinitely down, so the range is also all real numbers. Let's look at the next one. Here we have the fourth power function, f of x equals x to the fourth. So I'm going to set up again an xy table. Okay, so we're going to pick again some numbers for x. Like let's pick uh, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 again. Now if I put negative 2 in there, negative 2 to the fourth power is negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. That's going to be a positive 16. Negative 1 to the fourth power is going to be a positive 1. 0 to the fourth power is 0, 1 to the fourth power is 1, and 2 to the fourth power is a positive 16. So my y-axis, since I need to go up to 16, I'm going to count by 2's here. So 16 would be up here. Okay, so negative 2, positive 16. I'm going to count by 1's, by the way, on the y-axis. Okay, so negative 2, positive 16. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. We said it would be up here. Negative 1, 1. Oops. Zero, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 16. So when I connect these, Notice how it kind of looks like a parabola. Now, this is very important. Notice when we have an odd power function, our graphs are in quadrants 1 and 3. That will always be the same. Unless it's a negative x cubed, then it, might, then it would cause it to flip. But if we have an odd power function, so if the exponent is odd, 3, 5, 7, 9, even to the first power, it's going to be in uh, quadrants 1 and 3. If we have an even power function, our graph is always going to be in quadrants 1 and 2. It's very important to know. So to help us uh, to summarize that, oh by the way, your domain and range for this, your domain would be all real numbers and your range for this that we just looked at in 2b here would be greater than or equal, y would be greater than or equal to 0. But again, that's uh, going to be uh, stated here. If n is even, so if you have an even power exponent, don't worry so much about this. Uh, it's helpful, helpful to see that, just the fact that when I have negative 1, when I put negative 1 into the graph, you're going to get a positive 1 as your answer for, uh, for those. If you put 1 in there, you're going to get a positive 1. But like I said, that's not as important. The domain and range, it's important to recognize that for both of these, whether it's an even power function or an odd power function, that the domain is going to be all real numbers. When we're dealing with, like I, we just mentioned, an even power function, the range is going to be where y is greater than or equal to 0. But with an odd power function, since the graph is in quadrants 1 and 3, it goes infinitely up and down, the range is also all real numbers. Like we just talked about, the quadrants are important to know. That an even power function, it's in quadrants 1 and 2, and an odd power function is in 1 and 3. So what this is saying is that uh, the symmetry here is that when you're, having with an e when you're dealing with an even power function, there's a line of symmetry. We call that reflection over the y-axis. So 
if you look, if I reflect this over the y-axis, the two pairs of, or the two sides would line up with each other. So that's how you can define that. That's not we're not going to deal with that too much, but it's worth making note of. And with an odd power function, the symmetry there is a rotation uh, symmet symmetry, 180 degrees about the origin, meaning if I were to take this graph, let's say if I just focused on this part here, and if I were to rotate that 180 degrees, it would line up with the other half there. So that's where we get the rotational symmetry for an odd power function. And you can describe that like this, which again, we're not going to emphasize too much. The important is what I underlined there is in red here, knowing about the domain and range and what quadrants the graphs are going to be in. That's pretty much it. So this is just a basically an uh, uh, introduction to exponents and knowing again that odd power functions will always result in negative answers for y. If x is negative, I should point out, if x is negative, y will also be negative for an odd power function. And like we said over here, if we have an even power function, if x is negative, y will still always end up being positive. So on that, and that note, good luck on your assignment.